money makes the world go around. The world go around. The world go around. Money makes the world go around. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. I've been working on the railroad just to pass the time away. Can't you hear the? Hi. My name is Bob Didner. I'd like to share some thoughts with you about who the real job creators are now in early 2015. I'll be taking an engineering perspective. There's general agreement that the past five years of steady job growth, that's now about 200 to 250,000 new jobs a month, is far better than the 800,000 jobs lost every month around the end of 2008. However, we still need more and faster growth to complete the recovery from the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s and to stimulate employers to once again provide salary and wage increases that at least keep pace with the cost of living increases. The question I'd like to consider with you is what is the best way to increase job growth now? Many politicians claim that taxes should be lowered to put more money into the hands of the wealthy individuals and businesses who they call job creators. They claim that additional wealth put into the hands of these so-called job creators will motivate them to invest in things that create jobs and their added wealth will trickle down to everyone else. I believe there are times when some of this is true. The question, however, is now in 2015, one of those times. There are two foundations to my point of view. One is that an economy is not a static entity for which a given action will always have the same effect. It's a dynamic living entity which is constantly changing and what works today may not work tomorrow. The second foundation comes from my engineering background. If you want to change something like growing an economy and creating more jobs, first identify the limiting factor and concentrate on changing that. Putting the two foundations together, today's limiting factor of economic and job growth may be different from tomorrow's limiting factor. And the people and their entities that control the limiting factor at any particular time are the true job creators at that time. During the stagflation starting in 1979, for example, the limiting factor was the unaffordable cost of energy due to the Iranian Revolution, which caused the global oil supply to be reduced, even though it was only by about 4%. There have been times when lack of investment has been the limiting factor preventing economic and job growth. Such times are during the Great Depression of the 30s and the early days of the Great Recession of 2008. So what's the limiting factor now? Let's take a look at investment capital first and consider its usual sources. Corporate profits, corporate cash on hand, the stock market, wealthy individuals, and borrowing. Corporate profits are now at record highs. Non-financial corporations are sitting on record high $1.6 trillion, that's trillion with a T, in cash they don't know what to do with. They're also sitting on about $2 trillion in cash abroad. Last quarter saw so record high stock market prices. There are more billionaires and millionaires in our nation now than ever before. And interest rates are so low that foreign governments and businesses now pay for the privilege of lending money short term to our government. So now there's an overabundance of funds available for investment and borrowing. Investment capital is far from the limiting factor right now. While the individuals and organizations, therefore, do not control the limiting factor, since they are sitting on record levels of capital they are not investing in job creating activities. Therefore, they are not the job creators now. Cutting their taxes so they can retain more wealth will only provide them with more funds to sit on, buy elections with, 
or sock away in offshore tax havens. So if investment capital isn't the limiting factor, what is? It's not energy. All prices have been steadily declining since their 2011 peak, and the U.S. is now the number one producer of combined gas and oil in the world. The limiting factor now is demand. Businesses won't put cash to work, borrow, or sell more stock to make more stuff unless that stuff can be sold. So what's the best way to increase demand? Putting the 9 million unemployed to work will increase demand. There are currently 5 million domestic jobs that employers can't fill because they can't find qualified candidates. Investment in education and training to qualify more unemployed to fill these jobs will increase demand. Our roads and bridges are in the worst shape since World War II and will soon hamper businesses from getting supplies and sending their goods to market if not repaired. Hiring the unemployed to repair our crumbling infrastructure will increase demand. Increasing the minimum wage so it brings workers paid at that rate up to the poverty level will increase demand. To recover from the Great Depression, our government addressed the lack of investment by businesses and individuals by investing in our infrastructure we all still share and benefit from. It invested in great hydroelectric dams, national parks, roads and bridges, public transportation, post offices, and other public works. The products of this investment, which is still much of the foundation of our current economy, had side benefits, like reducing the demand for fossil fuels. The millions of people this put to work also increased demand. Some say that the government doesn't create jobs. The private sector does. The truth is that the federal government is by far the largest employer in our nation. So what about putting more money in the hands of the super wealthy and businesses by lowering their tax rates? Won't that increase demand that trickles down? Not much. The super wealthy already have about as many estates, jet planes, yachts, servants, and limousines as they want. So if giving more wealth to the super haves doesn't substantially increase demand, and investment isn't currently the limiting factor, whatever additional funds they receive will not increase demand or trickle down. In the 1980s, then-President Reagan led the first of the modern administrations to prove that trickle-down doesn't work and that lowering tax rates does not increase total tax revenues. After initial rate cuts, the tax revenue decreased so much that it would cause the national debt to quadruple, and that administration was forced to increase tax rates 11 times to keep the, the national debt from getting even worse. Also, the wealthy did not buy more or otherwise increase demand substantially when tax rates were lowered. Putting more funds into the hands of the middle class, and especially the poor, is the most effective way to increase demand, as was demonstrated by the recovery from the Great Depression. Unlike the wealthy, the middle class have needs and wants that are unfulfilled, like home improvements, travel, vehicle replacement, and education for their children. A large proportion of the additional wealth they receive goes towards fulfilling these needs and wants that were put off. Right now, the average middle class income has stagnated or even declined as adjusted for cost of living increases. Income levels are determined mainly by the laws of supply and demand. Currently, with the unemployment level still above 5%, demand is relatively low and supply is high so income has barely kept pace with inflation. The poor also have unfulfilled wants and even more unfulfilled needs, like shelter, better quality nutrition, and health care. Almost all of their additional income goes immediately to satisfy these needs and a bit to their wants. Most of the federal safety net program funds, like food stamps, go to the working poor, who earn less than the poverty level. So your tax dollars are in effect subsidizing the likes of the wealthiest family in our nation so they can pay many of their minimum wage workers less than the poverty level of income 
and your taxes pay for their food stamps to help their family survive. So what should the government do to help create jobs if not cutting tax rates of the wealthy? The number one priority should be to invest in repairing and improving our infrastructure. This not only creates middle and working class jobs immediately, increasing demand, but improves businesses' ability to get supplies and send their goods to market. Invest in public transportation. Once again, this creates jobs immediately. It also lowers the consumption of fossil fuels, which will run out eventually and contributes to the global climate crisis. Invest in affordable education. Our nation became the preeminent world economy in part because of the low cost and tuition free access to quality higher education, especially in math, science, and technology. Today, other nations have surpassed our educational position in these disciplines. When we achieved educational supremacy, there was ample access to free and very low cost education to some of the finest higher education institutions in our land, indeed the world. Some of the highest rated educational institutions were public and tuition free, like the University of California and the City University of New York. Government investments in these institutions paid economic benefits to our nation for generations at a time. Invest in research. Our nation was once the premier fountain of strategic research and innovation. We had the most advanced research organizations than our universities and private institutions like the legendary Bell Labs that innovated solid-state electronics, information theory, and effective ballistic missile defense systems that actually work decades before the ill-conceived Star Wars was attempted. Much of the advanced research was funded by government organizations like the Department of Energy and the National Institute of Health. Projects could take 20 or 30 years to pay off or never pay off. Today, the tiny remnant of Bell Labs is mostly owned by a foreign company. Government research investment is a pale shadow of its former levels, and industrial research projects are only funded if they have a short-term payoff horizon. Competitor nations have now surpassed our level of investment in strategic research and innovation. Our government should restore its former investment levels in basic and applied research in projects with long-term horizons and uncertain payoffs to help restore our competitive global position. So how do we pay for all of this? To pay for these investments that return dividends many times their cost, our government can cut back programs that don't help the economy and increase revenues. Start with military spending. Our nation spends more on our military than the total of the next eight to ten countries combined. The likelihood of another nation-to-nation -nation world war or prolonged conventional war like the misadventures in Vietnam and Iraq is extremely low. Military expenditures have an extremely slow rate of circulation through the economy, unlike infrastructure and education expenditures. Expenditures on pork barrel items, like advanced jet fighters that the military doesn't want and that don't work, are among the most wasteful expenditures of all, exceeded only by the likes of bridges to nowhere. Increase revenue. Close tax loopholes. There are now more than 70,000 pages of tax law dealing mostly with deductions for special interests. Most of these can and should be eliminated. For example, there's no reason why huge companies like GE should be able to earn over $10 billion in profit while paying zero or close to zero income tax. There's also no reason for hedge fund managers to pay less than half the income tax rate as others with similar income levels pay for risking other people's money. While our nation has a high nominal business tax rate compared to other industrial nations the effective rate actually paid after using those 70,000 plus pages is close to or below average and U.S. businesses have the greatest level of after-tax profit in the world. Close or limit the myriad of tax shelters like offshore investments and trusts that are only available to the super wealthy. 
I hope that I've made the point that right now, with an overabundance of investment capital looking for something to invest in, people and businesses with an overabundance of wealth are not currently the job creators. They don't control the limiting factor, demand. So when politicians tell you that we should lower tax rates now for the wealthy job creators, they may be spouting what their biggest campaign contributors want them to claim and enact, but their claims are, mm, let's say, factually challenged. If you want to know who the real job creators are right now, and you spend 70% or more of your after-tax income on necessities like food, shelter, heating, health care, clothing, education, and transportation, go to the nearest mirror and look deeply into the eyes you see there. You are gazing at a true job creator now in 2015. Thank you for the time you've spent listening to my point of view. Whether or not you agree with me, I ask that you support our Constitution by voting in every election.